uh, of the book of Hebrews. Then we get into the seventh, the Melchizedek priesthood. And then we get in from the Melchizedek priesthood into that great days of an atonement and separating, dividing the atonements. Then into that great faith chapter, the eleventh chapter and the twelfth chapter, laying aside every weight. And the thirteenth chapter, that eternal home, not built by man's hands, but God alone who has made this great home. How wonderful. I'm glad to see our sister back there. It's just entered the service. I see her and her husband. Yesterday we were on a road up across a place that I thought I knowed every little cracking corner by being game warden here in Indiana and patrolled for several years. I knowed every place, but I could have got lost yesterday up there. Where is that on top of the knobs, a new road? And the lady had cancer in the lungs. And the Lord definitely healed the woman. We took all, and how it all come, we were sitting there. Brother Roberson, he's probably in today. I see his wife. And um, Brother Woods, which is in, and we were up there in an old truck. Brother Roberson and I and Brother Woods, and we got this truck, went up there, top of the hill, and there the Lord showed the cancer definitely. And then we stood there and watched it leave the woman with her own eyes. We stood and watched it leave the woman. And she called back to Brother Woods' uh, wife and was telling me she's spitting up that real black stuff. And here she is this morning sitting back in the church, her and her beloved husband, having a wonderful time in the Lord. Isn't he wonderful? And I didn't know that the, here, usually to the people that's around, very seldom visions happen here. This is my home. And uh, I mean in the church. Sunday a week, we, how many was here to see the man in the wheelchair, blind, crippled, and balanced, and mental nerves gone, and males that give him up and... And some Catholic doctor, friend of mine, sent him up here. And before coming to the service, the Lord gave a vision of the man. You all know that. Amen. And there the man was healed by thus saith the Lord. See? And then got up, walked out, took his wheelchair, could see like you could or I can, and walked out of the building pushing his chair normally. And the balance nerve, you know, you can't hold yourself up. See, you just can't. And for years it said. And yesterday when I got there, the lady had been having a dream of seeing me come in just at two o'clock and pronounce her with cancer and then thus saith the Lord she was healed and it, and she woke up and it was just exactly two o'clock and the spirit of the Lord came down and there that that dream that she had and the Lord gave the interpretation and she was healed right there on the spot right there where we was watching Amen. how wonderful Praise the Lord. can't think of her name <laughs> What is, it? what is your name, Sister Walton? Sister Walton, sitting back there. Would you just stand up, Sister Walton? I want to ask you how you're feeling. Amen. It's good. Fine and then. He is so good to bless us in that manner. So we're expecting the exceedingly abundantly of God's great measure. A doctor had keeping this back from her. He told her that she's only breathing out of one side. What it was, a cancer had grown across and cut the breathing off of that side of the lung, you see. You can't see cancer through x-ray because cancer is a cell itself and it's, it's life. And you, it would just, it, you just look right through the cancer with an x-ray. You don't see it. And, um, but the Lord has really, we stood there and watched it ourselves with our own eyes. Watch it moving and seen it leave with our own eyes. So we're so grateful for that. And now, pray now for us this week while we're gone. And Brother Neville will probably take up where I left off for the Wednesday night service. Don't miss it now in this great chain of the book of the Revelation. Now, I know much prayer has been offered. And we, we know that God hears prayer. But we this morning we want to offer just a little prayer before the reading of the book. Amen. Now, any person that's able can read the book this way or can open it this way. But it takes God alone to open the understanding. Amen. Or He's the only one who can do it. So let us bow our heads just a moment. Now, Father, in the name of Thy beloved Son, the Lord Jesus, we most humbly come now to submit ourselves as Thy servants 
that you would speak through us, circumcise the lips that speak and the ears that hear, that the word might be spoke by God and heard by the Spirit in the people. Grant it, Father. For may he take the word of God and minister to us just as we have need. For we ask it in his name and for his glory. Amen. Now, reading this morning, we're studying. We're not, not preaching, just studying this book of Hebrews. How many is enjoying it? Oh, we're having a wonderful time. And now, just studying close Scripture up on Scripture. It must, the whole entire Bible ties together. There's not one word out of its place if it be placed together by the Holy Spirit. Now, man has said the Bible contradicts itself. I want to see it. Amen. I've asked 25 years for that, and no one's ever showed it yet. The Bible does not contradict. If it is, it isn't the Bible. The great infant Jehovah could not contradict his own self. So he's no contradiction in the Bible. It's just the misunderstandings of people. Now, for a little background till we go back. Now, the book of Hebrews was written by St. Paul to the Hebrews. He wrote one to the Ephesians. That was the people at Ephesus, the Christian church, one to the Romans at Rome, and one to the Galatians, and one to the Hebrews. Now, we notice that Paul being a Bible teacher to begin with, that's what we learn, that he sat under the great teacher of one of the greatest of his days, Gamaliel. And he was well versed in the Old Testament. He knew it well, but became a persecutor of the way that was Christ's way because he'd been trained in the Old Testament under teachers, but the teachers, usually carnal, I hope I don't say anything wrong, but usually if a man has just the teaching and the way of the schools, it's usually man-made. See, it doesn't inspire because it becomes a doctrine of a school. We have it today. Presbyterian, Luther, and Pentecostal, all these schools have their theory. And they just wind the Scriptures into this. And it was the same in the Old Testament. But Paul being well trained and knew the Scriptures by the Word. But you see, the Scriptures, no matter how well you know them, if the Spirit doesn't quicken them, then the letter killeth. The Spirit giveth life. See, it must be quickened are made alive by the Spirit. If the Spirit doesn't liven the Word and make it a reality to you, then the letter is just intellectual. Amen. That's where we have so many confessed Christians today, or professed Christians, is an intellectual conception of Christ. Then we got off on, well, he had to feel something, and he had to do something, and... Oh, we'll get into all that after a while. One had to shout. The Methodists used to have to shout before they had it. The Pentecostals had to speak with tongues before they had it. And uh, all, uh, some of them, the shakers used to have to shake. You know, they'd walk up and down, man on one side, women on the other. See? Shakers. Then the Holy Spirit come on and shuck them. They had it. But it's all just fantastics. It's none of it the truth. God lives in His Word. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing the Word. By faith are you saved through grace. Not by anything, whether you shake or speak with tongues or whatever takes place that has nothing to do into it at all. Jesus said, He that heareth my words and believeth on Him that sent me hath eternal life. Amen. He that heareth my word and believeth, been made quickened to him, hath eternal life. Amen. There it is. Praise God. Doesn't matter what little thing that you do now. I'm not against shaking or speaking with tongues or shaking. Oh, that that shouting, that's all right. That's fine. But that's only attributes. 
See? I could give you an apple off the tree and you still wouldn't have the tree. See, you it's the attributes. Amen. Lying, stealing, drinking, smoking, gambling, committing adultery. That's not sin. That's the attributes of unbelief. Amen. See? That's what you 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 do that because you are a sinner. Amen. See? But first you are a sinner, that's what makes you do that. Amen. Because you do not believe. And if you do believe, then you do not do that. Amen. Then you have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, meekness, patience. That's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Amen. See? So we got little things, that little sensations just because that man got off of the old beaten path of the Word. Amen. Okay. It's the Word. Faith cometh by hearing. So when Paul... God chose Paul. Man chose Matthias when he to cast the lots, but he never did nothing. That shows what a power the church has then to make a choice, to elect their deacons and send their preachers to different places. That's carnal many times. Let a man go where God leads him to go. I like that. If the people... In a conference, they'll say, well, here's a nice church. This brother's built up a nice church. And we have a little pet. They'll send him over to this church. They don't realize they're killing themselves. Amen. See? First place that that man goes in there, he can't fill that man's place. Amen. And then the only week in the church to try to show favor to some pet. It's always been that way. But I believe in the supreme Authority of the local assembly. Amen. Yes. Let each church be its own. Choose its pastors, its deacons, its whatever it is. Wow. And then that way the man in there has no bishop over him. The Holy Spirit wants to speak something to that church. They don't have to ask anybody about whether they could do this or do that. It's the individual in contact with the Holy Spirit. Show me by the Bible what's greater in the Bible than a local elder to a local church. That's right. Yes, sir, the sovereignty of the local church, each church in itself. A brotherhood, that's wonderful. All churches ought to be in a brotherhood like that together, but the sovereignty of local church. Notice, Paul being a great master teacher, well-trained, on his road down to Damascus one day to arrest the people that were in this new way. Now, he was sincere. God does not judge you by your sincerity. i never seen any more sincere people than the heathens. Many of them even kill their own children in vain for, for sacrifice to a, an idol. It's not the sincerity. A man could take carbolic acid sincerity thinking he was taking something else. Sincerity doesn't save you. It is the way that seemeth right unto a man. But the end thereof is the ways of death. Paul was sincere when he gave witness and his own authority to stone Stephen's. Later on in years, I like the apology of Paul. He said, I'm not worthy to be called the disciple or to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church even unto death with sincerity. And on his road down, he struck an experience. The Holy Spirit come out in a big pillar of fire and it blinded him. Now we went through that. That pillar of fire was Christ. Amen. And he's the same pillar of fire that led the children through the wilderness. Christ was God and God was Christ. Amen. God was made flesh and dwelt in the body of the Lord Jesus. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Showing what he was in the Bible back here in the former verses we've been reading. That he made himself lower than the angels. Taken on the form, not of angels, but taken on a form of flesh. 
Angels had not fallen. They need no redemption. Flesh had fell. Human beings, and they needed redemption. So in the old laws, a man to be a, a redeemer, first he had to be kin folks. The great book of Ruth we went through here some time ago. And how that God, being spirit, was made kin folks with us by becoming one of us in order to redeem us. And give us eternal life. He had to become us. That we through grace might become as He. And we find the pillar of fire led the children of Israel. And when it was made flesh here on earth. We hear Him talking one day. And He claimed that He was the pillar of fire. They said you say that you're greater than our father uh, Abraham. He said, before Abraham was, I am. Who was the I am? The pillar of fire in the burning bush. A perpetual memorial through every generation. Not only that generation, but this generation. The same pillar of fire. And we're thankful this morning that we even have the picture of it. That He has not changed. He's the immortal, eternal, blessed one. He does the same things now that he did then. And how happy it makes us feel. But before Paul would accept this experience, knowing that the angel of the Lord was the pillar of fire, which was Christ, well, he was the angel of the covenant which was Christ. Moses ch- thought better that, uh, chose rather to suffer the afflictions with the people of Christ and to be led by Christ than all the treasures of Egypt. Amen. He followed Christ, which was in the form of a pillar of fire. Then Christ said, I came from God when He's here on earth. I go back to God. After his death, burial, resurrection, glorified body, sitting at the right hand of the majesty to make intercession, Paul saw him as a pillar of fire again. A light that put his eyes out almost. Smote him blind. Peter saw him come into the jail as a light and open the doors before him as he went out. We find out that he was the Alpha and Omega the first and the last. And here He is with us today doing the very same things that He did then. Making Himself visible back to us. Showing it to the scientific world. Oh, in this great hour of darkness and chaos over the earth, we should be the happiest people in the whole earth. Amen. To rejoice, to know all the time when people are indocumented and all kinds of isms and things in the earth. And yet today the real living God by His Word and by His visible evidence shows us that He's here with us. Working, moving, living, acting just exactly as He always did. What a privileged people that we are to have this. We are to... The Bible said then in the second chapter... We should hold fast these things. Because how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Now, we come on to find out before Paul would accept that experience. Uh, We're drilling. Now, no matter what kind of an experience you ever have, church, I want to ask you something. No matter how good it looks, how real it seems, it first must be tested by the Bible. Always on the Word. Don't never leave that for any kind of an experience. And Paul, before he would accept it, he went down into Arabia and there stayed three years testing this experience with the Word. And when he come back, he was sure nothing could upset him for he was solid on the Word. Unmovable. Here's 
Therefore, he's turning out a show to these Hebrews. Those great things that were spoke of of the Old Testament was made manifest in Jesus Christ. What a glory. Now, last Sunday or last Wednesday, Brother Neville in here in the fifth chapter hits some very high places because it's a wonderful chapter. And we find him dealing on the fourth chapter last Sunday on the Sabbath, the keeping of the Sabbath. Are you sure this morning you know what the keeping of the Sabbath is? If you do, say amen. amen. The Sabbath is a rest that we enter into, not by day, not by law, but by entering into Christ, which is our Sabbath. He is our Sabbath. We run it all through the Old Testament and showed that the time would come when the Word would come line upon line, precept upon precept. And He proved that we entered His rest on Amen. the day of Pentecost. Amen. For this would cause the weary to rest, Amen. cease. And we find out that God limited a day in David about the seventh day, and God did rest the seventh, give it to the children of Israel in the wilderness, and again He limited a day. What day was it? A certain day in the week? The day when you hear His voice harden not your heart. Amen. That's the day He's entering in to give you an eternal peace. Amen. An eternal Sabbath. Amen. You don't go to church on Sunday to become religious then. When you're born to the Spirit of God, you enter into rest forever. Amen. No more Sabbath keeping. You're in the Sabbath Amen. continually forever and for eternity. Your worldly works has finished, says the Bible. And you've entered into this blessed peace. These first five chapters are positionally placing Jesus as high priest, God in sundry times and diverse manners spake to the fathers through the prophets. But in this last day through His Son Jesus. First chapter, first verse. Then on down to the ending up of the fifth chapter, we find Him represented as Melchizedek. Who had no beginning of days, no ending of your life. But continually a priest forever. Think of it. Who was this great man? We'll get it in about two more chapters. The entire life of him we're going to study. This great man who met Abraham, who never had any papa, never had any mama. He never had any time he ever begin life or he never will have a time that he will ever end life. Amen. And he met Abraham coming from the slaughters of the king. Notice this great person, whoever he was, is still alive. He had no end of life. It was Christ he met. Amen. We're going on a deep study of that in a few days. Now, we want to start over here in the fifth chapter now. Just for a little background before we hit the, the sixth. For it's really an outstanding something. Watch close. We're going to start about the seventh verse of this chapter. Well, let's start as the sixth verse. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. <clears throat> Who in his days of his flesh, when he offered up prayers and supplications of strong crying tears unto was as able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared. Though he was a son, yet learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Now, here's where I want to get to. This ninth verse, listen. I guess Brother Neville hit it Wednesday. I wasn't here. But listen. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation. Unto all them that obey him, called of God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom... We have many things to say. 
We'll leave it there on that because we're going to pick up Melchizedek in a few nights. Now we're going to start on this, our regular study. I wish I just read the rest of this for a moment. The 11th verse. Of whom we have many things to say, hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when the time ye ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk instead of strong meat. For every one that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Oh, I hope that Holy Spirit's taking that right down in the bottom of you now. For he that that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he's a baby. You give a baby strong meat, you kill it. That's the reason so many people say, oh, I, I don't believe that and walk away. Still babies. They just can't understand. They can't grasp that truth. It, it kills them. Great, mighty things the church should know today, but you couldn't teach it. They, 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 they stumble over it. They don't know what to do with it. Paul speaking to this Hebrew group. Yet scholars he's speaking to now. Scholars, well learned. We'll find out in a few, a few moments. Very scholarly. But the deep spiritual mystery, the church is still blinded to it. He said, when you ought to be teaching others, you're still a babe. Oh, I know this many rise up and go out and say, oh, I don't need to go to church anymore. Praise God, the Holy Ghost has come. He's a teacher. When you get that idea, you're just wrong. For why did the Holy Ghost set teachers in the church if He's going to be the teacher? Amen. There are first apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, and pastors. The Holy Spirit set teachers in the church so He could teach through that teacher. And if it, it is according to the Word, God doesn't confirm it, then it isn't the right kind of teaching. It must compare with the entire Bible and be just as alive today as it was then. There's the real thing made manifest. Now I notice. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age. Even those who by reasons use, have used their senses exercise to discern both good and evil. Know what's right and what's wrong by the discernment. Now notice. Starting now on our lesson. This great background now. Let's go for the first verse. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. What's he saying? All these first five chapters has been laid on Christ to show who he is. Now we're leaving those principles of the doctrines of Christ. What are we finding to be? We found him to be the great Jehovah God made manifest in flesh. We found him to, to be not a prophet, but the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Amen. He was Jehovah, made flesh. Amen. And the body, Jesus, only tabernacled him. Amen. God dwelling in man. God being reconciled to man through man. By the virgin birth of His own Son and Jehovah, the Spirit dwelt in Him. Amen. How many remembers the teaching about the Godhead, how we went back and found God like the great rainbow with all the different Spirit, how it was, and then the Logos went out of God, which became the Theosophy. And that was in the form of a man and Moses seen it pass by in the cleft of the rock. And then that theostomy was made absolutely human flesh. Amen. Christ. And how we find out that we, through His grace, have eternal life. Now the word forever is for a distance, for a space of time. It's said in the Bible forever and forever, a conjunction. 
But forever only means a time. But eternal means forever. And only everything that had a beginning has an end. But things which had no beginning has no end. So God had no beginning. And He has no end. And so therefore, Melchizedek, the great priest, like a man, he had no beginning and he has no end. And when we, through that theostomy, that we were made in the image of God before the world was ever made, when that theostomy has been made flesh and dwelt among us, then through his death we ourselves receive his spirit and we have no end. Amen. Eternal life. Not angels, but men and women. Oh, I, somehow, if I could only get it in a way that my, my audience would catch it. Amen. You will never be an angel. God made angels. Amen. But God made man. Amen. And what God does is off of God, which is as eternal as God is. Amen. And man's just as eternal as his creator. Amen. Because he was made from eternity. Amen. But sin has an end. Amen. Suffering has an end. Therefore, there cannot be an eternal hell. There's a hell of fire and brimstone. We know that. But there's no eternal hell. Amen. There's only one type of eternal life. And that belongs to God. If you're to suffer forever, you got eternal life. Hell has an end. It may be billions of years. But it'll finally come to an end. The Bible doesn't say anywhere that they suffered eternally. It said forever and forever. Jonah thought he's in the belly of the whale forever too. Forever has a distance or time limit. But eternal is perpetual. It has no beginning or end. It's like a ring. A circle. And as so our time moves on, we're only in revolving around the great motives of God. Amen. God's motive was to make man in His image to fellowship with Him. And He made Him a tangible being. Now sin brought us into a place of, of, of corruption. But that never stops the program of God. Amen. The sinner friend today, if you're not born again of the Spirit of God, you have an end somewhere. Amen. And your end is chaos and ruin and suffering and misery. But to you who have believed on the Lord Jesus and accepted the same as your personal Savior is just as eternal as God is eternal. Amen. You have no end. I give unto them eternal Zoe, God's own life. And they will never perish or come into the judgment even, but pass from death unto life. That's what he was. That's what he come for. Now Jesus in his coming of his priesthood did not come just for a, a sympathy's sake. Many people teach it like that. That he comes saying, well, maybe if I suffer, I will be a, a, a pitiful sight and people will surely come to me. That's an error. There's no scripture for that. For every person that ever will be saved... God knew them before the world was ever formed. The Bible said so. Amen. God's not willing now that anybody should perish. He wants them all to come to repentance. But being God by foreknowledge, He knew it. Look at Romans 8 chapter. Paul's holding up there saying about the election of God. That Esau and Jacob, before either baby was born or anything, God said that He knew them. And he hated Esau and loved Jacob before either boy had a, 
had a chance to express their gratitude. For he was God. He know he's infant. If he's infant, he don't ever flee, ever fly, ever nap, everything that ever be on the earth. He knew it. Amen. He's the infant, eternal, immortal, blessed God. Amen. Omnipotent, omnipresent, Amen. omnibition. There's nothing that he does know that's the reason he can tell what the end will be. He knowed the end from the beginning. Amen. What is prophetic is just his knowledge. He's a chief attorney. He's a, he's a judge. And he just speaks to the, the lawyer. Some of his wisdom. And that's what prophecy is. That can foretell it because he knows what's going to be. Now there's the God that we serve. Amen. Not a God of history. Not like the Buddhas and the Mohammeds and so forth. But a God that's omnipresent. Right now, here this morning in this tabernacle right now. Great Jehovah, I am. Who formed himself in humility to take on the form of sinful flesh. Here he is. That's who redeems you. There can be no other nowhere at no time can do it. God didn't have three people up there and sent one of them. His son. It was God himself. Come in the form of a son. A son has a beginning. And the son had a beginning. As some of you dear Catholic people, I've got your book. Facts of our faith said the eternal sonship of God. How are you going to express that word? How are you going to make it have sense? How can it be eternal? That's not the Bible. That's your book. Eternal sonship. They don't, that word's not right. For anything, it's a son had a beginning. And eternal has no beginning. So it is an eternal sonship. Christ become flesh and dwelt among us. He had a beginning. Well, no eternal sonship is the eternal Godhead. Not sonship. Now he came to redeem us and he did redeem us. Now, Paul getting that, which I'm sure that through the past lessons, you've understood it. We'll go over it again sometime. The Lord willing, just verse by verse. Now, therefore, having, leaving the, the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. That stumbles them, doesn't it? Let us do what? Let's go on unto perfection. Not leaning again. The foundations. Watch this. Let's get this word perfection. Do you know there's only one way you'll stand in the presence of God that's perfect? God cannot tolerate unholy things. And you legalist, how could you ever perfect yourself when you have not one thing to perfect yourself with? You were born in sin. Your very conception was in sin. The very desire of you being here was sin. Born in sin, shaped in iniquity, come to the world speaking lies. Now where are you going to stand then? Where are you sinner that said, I'll quit smoking and I'll go to heaven? Where are you lukewarm, moss-backed, so-called Christian that goes around here with a long face and saying it, well, I belong to the church. You sinner! Right! Unless you are born of the Spirit of God, you're lost. It's true. How you go to heaven? He said, I never lied in my life. Oh, the little darling, it was just an angel to begin with. That's a lie. I don't care how good you are, you're a sinner. And you don't have one thing that no priest, no bishop, no cardinal, no pope, nor nothing else can save you because he's just the same boat that you're in. Amen. We're getting into it in a few minutes. Amen. Just in the same shape he was. The Pope of Rome was born in sin, shaped in iniquity, come to the world speaking lies. Amen. Born by the sexual desire of a man and a woman. Where are you going to get righteous out of that? Well, his papa and mama were born the same way and they were born the same way and their grandma and grandpa went on back. It's sin to begin with. Right. Amen. 
So who can say this is holy and that's holy? There's only one thing holy. That's Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who's been made perfect. And our requirement is to be perfect. Now, how are we going to be it? Try it yourself. I'd hate to try to get to heaven on the merits of I was born five minutes ago and going out of the world right now. I'd be lost. If I never had an evil thought in my life, if I never spoke a bad word in my life, if I never looked at anything evil, never thought anything evil or nothing, I'm just as rank and black as the smutty walls of hell. I'm a sinner. I could come through life and stay locked up in a room and like some of the Carmelite sisters or something and never see the world, stay in there and pray all my life. Do good. Born to multi millionaire and give to the poor everything I got. I'm still a sinner and I'll go to hell. Amen. Yes, sir. I might join the Lutheran Church, Baptist, Pentecostal, Presbyterian when I'm on the cradle roll and live faithful to that church until a hundred years and my life is talking. No man could point their finger at me and say he ever even as, had as much as a bad thought. I'll go to hell just as sure as I'm standing. I'm a sinner. It's correct. I have nothing. There's no way at all I could find any, any price to be paid. God required death. And if I give my own life, if I give my life, then how can I repent? Because you, the debt's got to be paid first. And God was the only one who could lay his life down and take it up again. So he could become sin. And lay his life down and pick it up and call it justice in the death's pain. Amen. There you are. Now let's turn to Matthew, uh, about the 8th chapter, I believe it is. 7th or 8th chapter. We'll see what Jesus says over here. All right. It's uh, Matthew, the 5th chapter. And the Jesus the pe- preaching in the Beatitudes. The 47th verse, And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans? Watch. But be ye therefore perfect. What? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. That was Jesus' commandment. Be ye so... They say nobody can be perfect. The Bible said there is none perfect. There's your contradiction, is it? All right. You cannot be perfect in yourself. If you're trusting in what you've done, you're lost. So be ye perfect, even just as perfect as God is perfect. Now, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Therefore, now the... Fifth chapter, sixth chapter of Hebrews. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. Now, you Branham Tabernacle. Oh, I know we have healings. That's wonderful. We have visions. Oh, that's that's fine. And you have spiritual dreams. And uh, sometimes they're not spiritual dreams. And and uh, sometimes you. We, we try to help the poor. We do what we can. Oh, that's all right. But that's not what we're talking about now. We're entering into another phase. Leaving the doctrine. Oh, yes, we got the doctrine of Christ. We believe it was the Son of God, His virgin born. We believe that with all these things. That is just wonderful. But leaving that, let's go on to perfection. Oh, my, I wish I had the voice of an archangel now to bring this to a place where you could see it. Now, it says leaving all the doctrine of Christ, all the, th- the theologians and all the theology that we know, all about the deity of Christ, how He was God made flesh, all these other things. Paul goes on to explain it all here just in a few minutes. Let's just read it just a little bit before we get to it. Laying again the foundations of repentance from dead works, and we believe that, And faith towards God, we believe that. And of the doctrine of baptisms, just how you must be baptized, we believe that. And of laying on of hands, we believe in laying on of hands, don't we? Then, all that, sure. And of the resurrection of the dead, we believe that. Now watch, you see here, judgment is used eternal. 
That's forever. When judgment spoke of God, it's forever. Then there can be no more reconciliation after judgment's been passed. Now you can understand why God had to take His own, His own, as we call it, His own medicine. When He condemned man for sinning, the only way He could reconcile was to take the man's place Himself. That's the only way He could be reconciled or could reconcile us was take our place and become a sinner. God, Jehovah, became a sinner. And He gave His life. Now you could give your life as a sinner to die for the cause. Paul said, though I give my body to be burned as a sacrifice, I'm still nothing. Because it won't work. See, when you die, you're gone. You die as a sinner, you're lost. But God came down in flesh and condemned sin in the flesh, being made sinful flesh, because He was the eternal God and raised His own body up. So He's the justifier. Now, all these things, let's go on to perfection, said Paul. Now what? Now the eternal judgment. This will do, God permit. Third verse. Now go on to perfection. Jesus said, Be therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect, and we're every one condemned, no matter what we ever do, we're condemned. We were born condemned. Your mom and papa was born condemned. Your all your ancestors is born in sin, shaped in iniquity. So how are you ever go to get it? How are you going to be perfect? If you never done a thing, never stole, never lied, never done anything in your life, you're still condemned. You was condemned before you breathed your first breath. You were condemned. That's correct. And you were judged of God before you breathed your first breath. Or you were judged by the sexual desire of your father and mother who through their act brought you here on the earth and God condemned it in the beginning. You were condemned to start with. So where you never other person on earth was condemned with you. Now where are you going to get perfection? What? Let's turn just a moment to Hebrews, the 10th chapter. Listen close. I want to read a little bit out of the 9th chapter first. The 11th birth. But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, his own tabernacle, his flesh, See the old tabernacle. Did you notice? The old tabernacle had a veil in it that hid the ark where God lived. How many knows that? Sure. Well, that old man-made tabernacle here, the curtains out of dyed goat skins and so forth, were made a tabernacle to hide the presence of God. How many knows that only one man could go in there once a year? Certainly, that was Aaron. Go in once a year. And he must be anointed and... And oh, the requirement. And he must have fire in his hand. And if he went without that, he died as soon as he moved that veil back. He dropped dead. He must go in there and light these candlesticks and sprinkle the mercy seat, which called out the blood of the death of the substitutionary as till Christ was come to fulfill it. Now, but God then became in another type of a tabernacle. And that tabernacle was who? Jesus. And God was inside of Jesus. And He was hid. But He was reconciling the world to Himself by His expressions. Christ revealed God. He said, It's not me that doeth the works, it's my Father that dwelleth in me. I do nothing in myself but what I see the Father doing. The Father in me showing me these visions. And then I go do just what the Father told me to do. You get it? God was inside of a human body. Not behind goat skins died. But was a living, moving. God had hands. God had feet. God had tongue. God had eyes. And it was Christ. Amen. There he was. Now he went away, and the Spirit came in that, that through his death he might perfect the church and bring the church submissive. And then the same Spirit that was in Christ is in the church. 
doing the same things Christ did. A little while the world won't see me no more, yet ye shall see me, for I'll be with you even in you to the end of the world. Right. Now, listen to this. But Christ becoming a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. Amen. He wasn't made of hands. How was he born? Virgin birth. Neither by the blood of goats and calves was this body ever sacrificed or sanctified, but by his own blood. You know that the blood comes from the male sex. And then somebody said, Oh, Jesus was a Jew. He was not a Jew. Oh, we're saved by Jewish blood. No, we are not. If we were saved by Jewish blood, we're still lost. Jesus was not Jew, neither was he Gentile. He was God. God the Father, the Spirit, the unseen one. No man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten of the Father has declared him. He manifested God, what God was. Now his church is supposed to manifest God to show what God is. Amen. See? What do we do? Organize ourselves. I don't do it with them. They're Methodists. They're Presbyterians. I don't want to do it with them. I'm Baptist. I'm Pentecostal. You're lost with them kind of emotives. Right? Who can brag? Who can say anything? Look at the disgrace the Presbyterians has brought. Look at the disgrace of Baptists. Look at the disgrace of Catholics. Look at the disgrace of Pentecostals. Nazarenes, pilgrim holdings, look at the rest of them. But I challenge you to point one hand in disgrace at that. Yeah. Yeah. Point one finger when God Almighty said, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm pleased to dwell in. Hear ye him. Amen. There he is. That's the perfect one. Now, let's read just a little farther here now. Neither by the blood of goats, calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption. Do you get it? Eternal redemption for us. Not to be redeemed today, and the next week when the revival starts, be redeemed again. And then oh, we backslide and be redeemed again. You're redeemed once forever. It's right. No more redeem, redeem, redeem. Eternal redemption. He that heareth my words and believeth on him and sent me has eternal life and shall never come into the judgment. Amen. But hath past tense, pass from death unto life because he has shook, because he was baptized a certain way, because he had blood in his hand, because he has believed on the only begotten Son of God. Amen. That's how we have eternal redemption. Listen now. For the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of heifers Sprinkle the, un, uh, the, uh, uh, sprinkle the unclean, sanctify to the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, purge our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Amen. Pass from death unto life. What do you care what the world thinks? What do you care what your neighbor thinks? Amen. Our conscience has died and we're regenerated and born again by the Spirit of God to serve the true and the living God. Amen. There you are. Now, drop over to the 10th verse, 10th chapter, rather, right across the page. The law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices that they offered year by year continue to make their comer unto P-E-R-F-E-C-T-E-D. P-E-R-F-E-C-T, it is there. Perfect. Leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. The law having a shadow of good things to come, all the ordinances and the baptisms and the, all the other things they had, could never make the worshiper perfect. Amen. And yet, God requires perfect. Amen. You join the Nazarene church, will never make you perfect. You join the Baptist church, Pentecostal, whatever it is, it'll never make you perfect. You being a good, loyal man will never make you perfect. You can't merit one thing. There's nothing about you to merit. Amen. You're lost. 
You say, well, I kept the law, I keep the Sabbath, I keep this, all the ordinances of God. I do this. Paul said, let us lay aside all those things now. That's all right, but we'll do this. We'll baptize the people and we'll lay hands on them for the healing and so forth. We can take it verse by verse. Each one of those things, baptism, we believe it. There's one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. We believe that there's a baptism. We believe in the resurrection of the dead. Absolutely, we believe Jesus died and rose again. We believe that. Laying on the hands for the sick. That's why I said, these signs shall follow them that believe. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. We believe that. But what is that? Paul said it's all dead works. It's something that you do. Now let's go on to perfection. Oh, my. We're coming into the tabernacle, not the foundation, the tabernacle. The tabernacle itself. That's the foundation. The law and the righteousness and, 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 and joining church and being baptized and, and laying on of hands. Them's all orders of the church. But now let's go into perfection. Amen. And there's only one that is perfected. That's Jesus. How do we get into Him? Through the Methodists? No. Pentecostal? No. Baptist? No. Through any church? No. Roman Catholic? No. How do we get into it? Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ that walk not after the things of this world, the flesh, but after the things of the Spirit that pay no attention to what the world's got to say. Even if you're sick, the doctor says you're going to die, you pay no attention to it. Don't bother you a bit. If they tell you you have to become a Catholic before you're saved or a Presbyterian or have to do this, you pay no attention to it. There are no no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh the things that they see. Everything you see with your eyes is earthly. But it's the things you see in your spirit through the Word. The Word is God's looking glass. That reflects what He is and what you are. Hallelujah! Oh my! It tells you this is the only book in the world that tells you where you come from, who you are, and where you're going. Show me any page of literature anywhere. All the science or anything else ever a good book has been written. None of it can tell you that. This is God's looking glass. That shows what He is and what you are. Amen. Then in between there's a bloodline that shows what you can be if you want to make the choice. Amen. There you are. By one Spirit. Now, 1 Corinthians 12, how do we get into that body? Amen. By shaking hands? No, sir. Amen. By joining the church? No, sir. By being baptized backward, forward, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of Rosa Sharon, Lily Valley, Morning Star... Anything that you want, that has nothing to do with it, just the answer of a good conscience towards God. And yet we fuss and stew and argue and split and make differences. That's right. But all those are dead works. We're going to perfection. That's things that I do. And a minister baptized you. Whether he baptized you face forward, backward, or three times, four times, or one time, or how he did it, that has nothing to do with it. You're just baptized into the fellowship of that church anyhow. Proving to that church you believe the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Laying all of hands to heal the sick. That's wonderful, but it's all natural and that body will die again as certain as you're living. Amen. It'll die again. Now let's lay aside all those things and go on to perfection. How do we get to perfection? That's what we want to know. Christ is perfected. God laid upon Him the iniquity of us all. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, and chastened our peace up on Him. With His stripes we were healed. That's the body we want to get to. That's the body. Why? If you're in that body, you'll never see judgment. You'll never taste the death. You're free from all death, judgment, sin, and everything else when you're in that body. Amen. How do you get into it, preacher? By joining this tabernacle, you're lost yet. Couldn't join anyhow. We don't have any book. How do we get into it? By joining some church? No, sir. How do you get into it? You're born in it. 1 Corinthians 12. 
For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body. By the Holy Spirit baptism we are baptized into that body and are free from sin. God don't see you no more. He only sees Christ. And when you're in that body, God can't judge that body. He's already judged it. He took our judgments and invited us in. And by faith through grace, we walk and accept our pardoning. And the Holy Spirit brings us into this fellowship with Him. And we walk no more at the things of the world, but we walk in the Spirit. Quickened the Word came to us. He died in my stead. I made alive. Here I am who was once dead in sin and trespass, been made alive. All my desires is to serve Him. All my love is to Him. All my walks want to be in His name. Now wherever I go, whatever I do, I glorify Him. If I'm a hunting, if I'm a fishing, if I'm playing ball, if, if I'm whatever I'm doing, I must be Christ in me in such a life that will make man long to be that way. Amen. Not paddling, backbiting, and fussing about your churches. You get it? By one Spirit, we are baptized into that body. And when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. Amen. Listen, let's read just a little further here, please. What? Could never make the come around to perfect. For, second verse of the 10th chapter, for then they would not have ceased to be offered. If that can make the person perfect, and God requires perfection, if keeping the laws, if doing all the commandments would make you perfect, then there's no, there, there's no need of having anything else. You're already made perfect. Because when you're perfect, you're eternal. Because God's the only one that's eternal, and God's the only one perfect. And the only way you can be eternal is become part of God. Once purged should have no more conscience of sin. Once. The worshiper once purged should have no more conscience. If you write the translation on it, it's desire. The worshiper once purged has no more desire of sin. If the worshiper was once purged, you go up now and say, Oh, hallelujah, I got saved last night. But, I, well, bless God, she made me backslide. Hallelujah, someday I'll... Get saved again, you poor, untrained, illiterate. That's not the way it is. The worshiper once purged has no more conscience of sin. The Bible said, listen, as we read on just a minute. But in those sacrifices, as remember, against sin yearly. Now we're going to drop down to hit above, uh, the eighth verse to save time or I want to get to. Above then when he said, sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings for sin... Thou wouldest not, neither has thy pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Ninth verse. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the take he taketh away the first, the law, that he may establish the second. Wish we had time to stay on that. As long as you're a Presbyterian or a Pentecostal or a Baptist or Methodist, he can never do nothing with you. He has to take that all away first. <laughs> See? So he can establish the second. <laughs> Long as you say, "Well, I'm a Methodist. I'm nothing against Methodists or Baptists or Pentecostal, but brother, that don't that don't spell it. <laughs> You've got to go on to perfection. That's into Christ. Watch this now, just a minute. By the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Huh?" Let's just read just a little further and hold that. Let that soak in while we're reading. Once for all. And every priest standing daily ministering the offering off time the same sacrifice which can never take away sin. But this man, are you ready? You got your vest open now so it won't dodge. It'll go right to the heart. But this man, what man? Not the Pope of Rome. Not the bishop of the Methodist church or any other church. But this man, Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever set down at the right hand of God from henceforth expect until his enemies be made his footstool. Watch. Here she comes. 
for by one offer he has P-E-R-F-E-C-T-E-D he has perfected until the next revival what did I say? he has perfected forever them that are sanctified do you get it? Let us go on to perfection. Now you holiness people say, Oh yeah, we believe in holiness. Hallelujah. We believe in sanctification, but you're taking your own. You just quit this and quit that. You know, you shouldn't do it. Unless Christ has opened the door and quickened it to your heart and you become a place where sin is dead in desire. It's all gone. Then He taketh away your own self-righteousness. He may establish Himself in you. And it's Christ, the Son of God, in you. Amen. The hope of glory. Amen. Let us go on to perfection. How can we be perfect? Through the death of Christ, not through joining church, not through our good works, what we do, that's all all right. Not because we were baptized this way or that way, not because we've been healed by laying on of hands, not because of any of these other things. We believe in the death, burial, and resurrection. Paul said, I could speak with tongue like man and angels. That's both the tongues that is understood and the tongues that cannot be understood has to be interpreted. I am nothing. Though I have the gift of knowledge and understand all the wisdom of God can explain the Bible from power together, I am nothing. Don't do much good to go to school then, does it? <laughs> to learn the Bible. Though I have faith that I can move mountains. Healing campaigns don't mean very much then, does it? I'm nothing. Though I give my body to be burned as a sacrifice. Boy, they say that man's religious, but he's nothing, Paul said. Never become nothing. For where there's tongues, they shall cease. Where's prophecies, it shall fail. Where there's all these other things will fail. But when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part will be done away with. See? That perfect, what is perfect? Love. What is love? God. Let us... Lay aside all these little dead works and artists and go on to perfection. You see it? We're perfected through Christ. How do we get into it? By Holy Spirit baptism. How, what happens? You pass from death unto life. Well, do I shake, jump? Do you, you don't have to do nothing. You've already done it. God brought you from death unto life in your life. Then your fruits of your life Show it. A lot of you Methodists and Nazarenes shouted this as hard as you could shout. Steal corn out of a man's patch. That's right. Do everything it could be. A lot of you Pentecostals spoke in tongues like pouring peas on a cowhide. Sure. Went right out and run away with the next man's wife. Done all kinds of things. That's not it, brother. Don't try to have any sensation, anything to take the place of the Holy Spirit. When the new birth has come, you are changed. You don't have to do anything to prove it. Your life proves it. As you walk, your love, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, patience, that's what you are. And the whole world sees the reflection of Jesus Christ in you. Now, speaking in tongues, shouting, that's just attributes that follow this kind of a life. And you can take impersonate those attributes and never have that life. We see it. How many knows that's true? Sure you do. Certainly you do. Might see it all around you. So there's nothing you say that's the evidence of the Holy Ghost unless it's your life that you live. Now, if you want to speak with tongues, that's perfectly all right if you live the life to back it up. That's right. And if you want to shout, fine. That's good. I shout too. Get so happy sometimes that I can't hardly wear a pair of shoes. I don't like to jump out of them. And that's wonderful. I believe it. I've seen visions in the sick healed, the dead raised. When they're laying out there in the doctor's walkway and say they're finished and gone, Lay there a couple of hours and the Holy Spirit come right down and show a vision. Go down there and raise that person up. Amen. I've seen those who are deaf, dumb, and blind, and crippled walk. That doesn't happen. That's just attributes. Brother, long time ago, before the world was ever had a foundation to it, God, through His eternal grace, He looked down and by foreknowledge, He's seen you and I. He knew what age we'd live in. He knew what we would be. Therefore, by election, He chose us before the foundation of the world to be with Him without spot. Now, if He chose us before the foundation of the world to be in Him without spot, and we're born all spotted and nothing else can, nothing can cleanse us, how are we going to be without, how are we going to be at that spot? 
He sent His only begotten Son. And whosoever believeth in Him should not have an end of life, but have eternal life. Should never perish, but have eternal life. Then when we come into Him by faith through grace, are we saved by the Holy Spirit calling to us? Before there was a body on this earth, your bodies were laying here. It's made out of calcium, potash, moisture, cosmo, uh, cosmic light, and petroleums, and so forth. Sixteen elements. And the Holy Spirit began to brood over the earth, wooing. And it then, first thing you know, up come a little Easter flower. Then he brewed out some grass and some birds, and after a while a man come forth. Now, he never made a woman out of the dust of the earth. She's always a man to begin with. The man and woman are one. So he took from the side of Adam a rib and made a woman a helpmate to him, and then sin come in. Then after sin came in, God will not be defeated no matter what takes place. He'll never be defeated. Then women begin to bring man on the earth and God through eternal grace seeing who would be saved and He called you. No man can come to me except my Father calls him first. Amen. Not him that willeth or him that runneth but God that showeth mercy. Amen. You say, well, I sought God, I sought God. No, you never. God sought you. Amen. That's why it wasn't the beginning. It wasn't Adam saying, oh, Father, Father, I've sinned. Where are you? It was Father saying, oh, Adam, Adam, where are you? That's the nature of man. That's the strain of man. That's what he's made of. And no man can come to me except the Father draws him in. All that the Father gives me. Hallelujah. All that come, I'll give him eternal life and I'll raise him up at the last day. Amen. What a blessed, what a blessed promise of a God of heaven. Where we get to tonight where he swore by himself there's none greater. You take an oath for someone greater than you. No one greater. So God took an oath to himself. We're getting into it. How he did it and when he did it. And talking all to himself that he would raise us up and make us his own heritage. Oh, how perfect and solid we can stand this morning. How you can look at death staring you right in the face. You can say like Paul, death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? But thanks be to God who gives us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. There you are. Why? Oh, you did so and so. I know it, but I'm covered by his blood. Hallelujah. By one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. You Methodists, Baptists, Presbyterians, whatever you are. We were baptized into one body. We have fellowship and we're citizens of the kingdom of God. Amen. Professing that we are not of this world. Amen. My little girl come to me and said, Daddy, this little girl did so and so and they did so and so. We went with the house and they did so and so. I said, so why don't we do that? I said, honey, we are not of that world. They live in a world to themselves. I said, well, don't we all walk on the same ground? I said, of the world, honey. We're not of them, people. The Bible said, come out of them. Be separated, saith God. See? Amen. You're not of that. And when that new nature comes into you, you don't have to be pulled out. You don't want to go back like Lot's wife. You're just born out of it. And you're in another dimension. And that looks trashy to you. And this is a great, fabulous America that we live in has become one big chaos of it. Everything is lust and women and women the way they're dressing the man the way they're acting and, and the things they're doing and then call themselves Christians. For instance, this Elvis Presley going and joining the Pentecostal church now. Of course, that's where Judas got 30 pieces of silver. Elvis got a fleet of Catholics and a, and a few million dollars for selling his birthrights. Arthur Godfrey, look at that. Look over here at Jimmy Osborne in Louisville. Out there, that old boogie-woogie rock and roll old Tommy Rotten filth and on Sunday morning, take the Bible and stand on the platform and preach. What a disgrace. No one of the Bible said, ever table's full of vomit. Why we're living in a terrible day. And people say, oh, they're very religious. Oh. So don't you know that the devil is religious? Don't you know that Cain was just as religious as Abel was? But he didn't have the revelation. <laughs> That's it. He didn't have the revelation. Yeah, we all go to church, but there's some's got life. That's one's got the revelation of Jesus Christ in their heart. Not by shaking, jumping, not by joining church, but the revelation God has revealed him. Look what said, Who does man say, I the son of man am? Some said, You're a prophet, and some say, You're lies, and some said, But who do you say? Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That wasn't from his lips. He said, Blessed art thou, Simon, the son of Jonas. For flesh and blood never reveal this. You never learn this in some some ethics of the Bible or some uh, theological seminary. Blessed are ye, for flesh and blood has not revealed it to you, but my Father which is in heaven has revealed it. And upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell can't prevail against it. Amen. If you're a Christian this morning because you belong to church, you're lost. 
If you're a Christian because you've passed from death into life, you're free from judgment in the Christ. You're becoming into perfection all the time. God cannot see one thing. You say, well, will I ever make a mistake? Sure. But you don't do it willfully. Now, we're getting into that just in a few minutes. For he that sins willfully after he received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. We get into that tonight because it's a little too late. Now, let's read just a couple more verses of this so we can feel better about getting down a little more. All right. Well, we start right in on that tonight, the fourth verse. Listen to this. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and made and have been and have tasted of the power of the heavenly gifts and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and tasted the good word of God and the power of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew themselves into repentance. And we take that into Hebrews 10 and back and forth to show what this is. Friends, let us go on to perfection. We have we're not we're without excuse today. We have no excuse at all. The God of heaven has appeared in these last days and is doing the very same things that He did that when He was here before, when He's on earth. He's proved, as we're coming through this Bible, and you, you class know this, that we have taken miracle by miracle and sign by sign and wonder by wonder that He did with the children in the wilderness, the things and signs that He did, the things that He done when He was here on earth manifest in the flesh, and the very same things are taking place today right here among us. Amen. Here's a word to vindicate it. Here's the thing to say it's right, to make it right. Here's the Spirit of God to do the same thing. So we're without an excuse. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, seeing that we are compassed about by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every word, everything, every wrong, every evil word, every bad spoken word, every thought, and let us run with patience the race that's set before us. Looking to the author and finisher of our faith, the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, blessed be His most matchless and holy name. How that He came to earth to redeem fallen man and to bring them back into the fellowship of the Lord God. And we thank Thee for this. And now, by His grace, we never chose Him, but He chose us. He said, You have not chosen me, but I chose you. When? Before the foundation of the world. And dear God, if there be some sitting here this morning, maybe who's put this off for years and years, but constantly there's a little knocking at the heart. Maybe they join church thinking, well, it'll be all right. Father, sure, the Scriptures has explained it this morning that you cannot hide behind a church and be righteous. Neither can you be good, not lie and steal and do anything bad and still be righteous. There's only one righteousness we have, not of our own, but His righteousness. He has perfected our salvation. Therefore, being in Him, God does not see our mistakes. When we do anything wrong, there's a spirit in us that screams out, Oh, Father, forgive me. Then God does not see it. And so we are brought into fellowship and grace with Him. Grant it, Lord, while we close this service in Christ's name. Amen. Just for a moment, I'd like to ask you, no matter what you do, you're lost. Listen to this. Some time ago, I might have told it before. Here's a little experience happened to me. I was up at, at a Toledo High. I was in a revival and, and having a meeting down there. And so many people, they know the hotels is that, so they're taking me out into the country. And I stand out there at a little motel. We've been eating at a little Dunkard restaurant. It was a wonderful place. The little ladies in there, just as Christian and sainted looking as they could be, clean and real nice. Sunday come, I got hungry. I'd been fasting a little, and I want to go across the street to another order a little a little road there by a corner and there's a just a regular common American place there to eat little had a little place at cafe open all night when I walked in there on that Sunday about two o'clock in the afternoon before going down to the preach that afternoon I was so gotten I didn't know what to do I walked in and the first thing I noticed was a young lady about 16 18 years old some papa's darling some mother's darling standing back there with a boy with her hands around her hips bunch of teenagers sitting at the at the counter I heard a slot machine and looked over here and there was a policeman standing there with his arm around a woman up around here or waistline playing a slot machine now you know that gambling and slot machines is illegal in Ohio you Buckeye people here and you know that's illegal and here was a law playing a slot machine and a man of my age probably married a bunch of children maybe a grandfather a policeman, road patrol, playing a slot machine. There's that young, what's a teenage young, what's this done? I stood there, nobody noticed me coming in. They was too busy, half of them drunk. 
So I watched. I heard somebody saying, Well, do you think the rain will hurt the rhubarb? And I looked around over here. And here sat a lady sitting there, an old lady, real. She was 65, 70, close to it. And the poor lady, I don't blame anyone for looking their best. But when she, she had fixed herself and made her hair blue, real blue looking, and all cut off over the top, made it real blue. And she had on real thick uh, manicure, or what you call the stuff put on her face, and a big spots. And she had on little bitty shorts. And the poor old thing was so wrinkled to the meat, flab meat was hanging down like that over her legs. And she was drunk. She was sitting there with an old man in the summertime with one of these old gray army overcoats on her olive drab. And hanging down like that and a big scarf around his neck. Drunk, two of them. And they was with this poor old woman. I stood there and looked around. I said, God, how can you stand it? How do you look at such as that? When it makes me a sinner, saved by grace, think that. How can can you look at it? Well, it looks like you'd burst the thing open. Will my little Rebecca and Sarah have to come up under that kind of an influence? Will my two little girls have to meet a, a pauper, so known world as it is today where the people act like that? God, how can I ever? What can I do? Of course, it's His grace. If they were ordained eternal life, they'll come to it. If they wasn't, they won't. I don't know. That's up to God. I'll do my part. I thought, how can you stand it, God? Look like you're so holy that you just whack that thing off the earth. I said, look at that poor grandmother sitting there. Look at that young girl back there. And here's a woman standing here, probably 25 years old. And that police with his arms around her waist playing a slot machine and there's the law of the nation's gone. There's the motherhood gone. Here's the elder gone and there's the young girl sitting back there and she's gone. Look at the boys when they ought to be in church or somewhere. I said, oh God, what can I do? And here I am in this city of crying with all my heart. And they ignore it and walk as if they were... I thought, well, God... Well, then a thought come, if I haven't called them, how can they come? All the Father has given me will come. You have eyes, but you can't see ears and you can't hear. I thought, well, if the president would come to town instead of the revival, everybody would come out. Oh, sure, that's worldly. Then I got to thinking, well, God, why don't you just go come on and send Jesus and let's have it over with. Why don't you just go and have it all over with and let it go? And then I began to see something moving in front of me. It looked like a little whirl going around like this. I kept watching it. And I saw a whirl turning around and around. And I watched it and where it was spraying something off. And I looked and it was a spray of red crimson blood across around the world. It was like a whirl going around like a comet. And it had a whirl around like this. And I looked at this whirl and just above it I saw Jesus in the vision, he was looking down. And I seen myself standing down here on the earth doing the things that I should not do. And every time that I sinned, God would have killed me. Because the day you hear the day you die, God's holiness and justice requires. And you'd have to die. And then I looked there and I kept rubbing my eyes. I said, I'm not, I never went to sleep. I'm, it's a vision. I'm sure this is a vision. I kept watching as I stood behind the door. And I seen my own sins come up. And every time they would start to hit the throne, His blood act like a bumper on a car. It caught it and I'd see it shake. And the blood would run down His face. And I seen Him raise His hands and said, Father, forgive Him. He doesn't know what He's doing. I seen myself do something else. It shook Him again. Boom. It would've, God would have killed me right then. But His blood was a-catching me. It was holding my sins. And I thought, oh God, did I do that? Surely it wasn't me, but it was. Then I went walking like this, like I was going through that room, and I walked up close to Him. I seen a book laying there and had my name on it, and all kinds of black letters wrote across it. I said, Lord, I'm sorry I did this. Did my sins cause You to do that? Did I spin Your blood around the world? Did I... Did I do this to you, Lord? I'm so sorry that I did it. 
And he reached out and said, Will you forgive me? I didn't mean to. I'll, you By your grace, I'll try to be a better boy if you just help me. He took his hand and patted his side, tucked his finger and wrote pardon on my book, thrown it over behind him. The sea of forgiveness, I watched it a little bit. And he said, Now, I forgive you, but you want to condemn her. Okay. said, You're forgiven, but what about her? You want to blow her up. You didn't want her to live. I thought, oh, God, forgive me. I didn't mean to think that. I didn't want to do that. I, I, I didn't want to do that. You're forgiven. You feel all right, but what about her? She needs it too. She needs it. Well, I thought, God, how do I know who you've called and who you haven't called? It's my business to speak to everyone. So when the vision left me, I walked over to her. I said, how do you do, lady? And them two men went to the restroom. And they, she was sitting there, eat cupping, you know, laughing, the bottle of whiskey sitting on the table, or beer it was, alcohol, sitting there where they'd been drinking. I walked up and said, how do you do? And she said, oh, hello. And I said, could I sit down? She said, oh, i got company. And I said, I didn't mean it in that way, sister. She looked at me when I called her sister. She said, what do you want? I said, could I sit down just a minute? She said, help yourself. And I sat down. I told her what had happened. She said, what's your name? And I said, Branham. She said, are you the man down here in this arena? And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, I've been wanting to come down there. She said, Mr. Branham, I was raised in a Christian family. She said, i got two young girls as Christian. But certain, certain things happened and she got on the wrong road or started. I said, but sister, I don't care... The blood's still around you. This world's covered over with blood. If it didn't, God would kill us, everyone. He, when that blood's moved, look out for judgment. But now, if you die without that blood, you go beyond that place. Amen. Then there's nothing to act for you. Today, the blood acts in your stead. I said, lady, sure, the blood still got you covered. As long as you got breath in your body, the blood has you covered. But someday when the breath leaves here, the soul goes out, you'll go beyond that blood and there's nothing but judgment while you've got a chance for pardon. And I took her by the hand. She's crying. I said, Mr. Branham, I'm drinking. I said, that don't hurt. Something or another has warned me to come tell you. I said, God, before the foundation of the world calls you, sister, and you're doing wrong and you're only making it worse. She said, do you think you would have me? I said, absolutely he'd have you. There on her knees, we got down in the middle of that floor in an old-fashioned prayer meeting. That police took off his hat and bowed on one knee. There we had a prayer meeting in that place. Why? God's sovereign laying aside these dead works. Let us go on to perfection. Let's move into that realm where these, I belong to church and I belong to That's all finished and let's go to perfection. My sinner friend, if you're without the blood today, without salvation, without grace, the blood of Jesus Christ holds you. You say, oh, I've got by all this time, but one day you're going where there's nothing to act for you then. Let us pray now while we bow our heads. Is there would be one here today would like to say, God, be merciful to me. I realize that I've done wrong. Maybe you've joined church. That's all right. But if you haven't received the grace of Christ... Would you raise your hand and say, pray for me, Brother Branham. God bless you, mister. God bless you, lady. That's right. Don't, God bless you, sir, back there. God bless you and you. Way back in the back. Yes, God bless you. Raise your hand. That's right. Just put your hand up and say, God, be merciful to me. You say, I belong to church, Brother Branham. Yes, I, I've tried to be good, but I don't know. I just seem like I can't do it. Oh, poor pilgrim. Poor decrepit friend. You've really never seen the vision yet. You say, Brother Bram, I shouted, I spoke with tongues, I've done all this. That might be true too. That's all right. Nothing to say against that, but my dear lost friend, but to speak with tongues or to shake or to shake hands or to be baptized, that that's all right. But to know him is to know a person. To know him is life. You say, I know the Bible real well. Well, to know the Bible is not life. To know Him, the personal pronoun, to know Him, Christ. 
that you know He's forgiven you, would you just raise your hands again? Someone else? God bless you, lady. God bless you, sir. God bless you over here, brother. God bless you back there, young man. God bless you over here, sister. God bless you way back in the back there. That's right. To know Him is life. Brother Bram, remember me. I'm now right here in my seat going to accept Christ. Say, come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and give unto me that peace, that sweetness. Go to church, play the music as hard as you can, dance up and down, run through the aisle, go home weary and toss and fuss. That's not Christ. You go to church, sit and listen to some little sermon about how the bridge is going to be painted or something other like that, never hear the Word. The Word brings life. It's the seed. Don't you want peace? Are you bothered about dying? You could have a heart attack today. Does it weary you? Or would you rejoice to say, I'm going to be with the Lord Jesus on the end of this road? Do you know Him? If you don't, just raise your hand. We're going to ask prayer for you. Yes, brother, you do. All right. In your heart now, just that. I will have one plea, but that thy blood was shed for who? For me, because I promise I. I come tenderly, mercifully, just as. Just walk right to Him by faith. Believe that He's standing right there by your side. He is. Ding, not to rid my soul. Of how much now? Of one temper, malice. To him whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb. By faith I walk to the cross this morning. I lay my burdens down. I come. God bless you back there. That's good. Mm Don't be indifferent now. Warmly, sweetly, walk right up to the cross. In the Old Testament, they brought a lamb. They know that sin. They know it by the commandments. You know it now because God spoke to your heart. They took, looked at the commandments. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not uh, do so and so. And they took a lamb, went put their hands on the lamb. The priest cut the throat. The little fellow was kicking and bleeding and blading and dying. His hands was all covered with the blood. The lamb died in his stead, but he walked out with the same desire to do it again. But in this place, we come by faith through grace. God called us. We lay our hands on the head of the Lamb of God. We hear that swinging hammer. We hear that voice, I thirst, give me drink. Father, lay not this sin to their charge. They don't know what they're doing. See, by faith, we feel his death there in our stead. Way then in our heart comes a deep, settled peace when a voice says, You're pardoned now. Go and sin no more. How by grace then we walk away with not the same desire, but a desire never to sin no more to do anything wrong. The peace that passes all understanding is in our heart. May you receive it now while we pray, everyone together. Heavenly Father, they're coming by faith to grace there's about a dozen hands went up. It's the fruits of the message. They come to you. They believe. I believe in them too, Lord. I believe that truly the Holy Spirit spoke to them. And by faith they're coming right up Jacob's ladder now. Right up to the foot of the cross. They're laying down all their sins and saying, Lord, it's too much for me. I just can't bear it any longer. 
And will you take away my load of sin and take the desire out of my heart to do so? And let me by faith this day receive you as my personal Savior. And from henceforth, I'll follow you every mile of the way to the end of the journey. I catch a glimpse of what it means to go on to perfection, not going into church, and the roots of dead works like baptisms and so forth. But I want to go on until I can be no more and Christ can live in me. Oh, Jesus, grant this to each penitent soul this morning. Everyone that raised their hands shall receive eternal life because you promised it. They made a public exception. They raised their hands. They broke all the laws of gravitation. They made science feel ashamed of themselves because science says your arms has to hang down. Anything would prove that in science. That it must stay earthbound because gravitation hold it down. But there was a spirit in them that made a decision. And they defied the laws of gravitation and raised their hands. You've seen it, Lord. You put their name on the book. Pardon the old books back in the seal of forgiveness. And I'll never be remembered no more. Let them go forward today as loving, sweet Christians to serve you. And maybe many didn't raise their hand. Grant to them also. Let the saints walk us a little closer, Lord. For we're one day near home than we were yesterday. Be thou with us, Lord, for we ask it in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen.